my talk today will might be a little bit different from the talks you've had in the last four days or so because I will be coming from the perspective of a uh, scientific engineer uh, using or trying to use machine learning to solve real-world problems. So as you, as you can see from the title, um, I'm interested in combining essentially PDE solvers with machine learning methods, and I'll do that for the application from mainly aerospace engineering. My background is in aerospace engineering as well, but I'm drifting towards applied math back and forth. So I'm kind of in between those two worlds. I want to keep this, uh, this session today not like a lecture, but hopefully more a little bit like a dialogue. So whenever you have uh, questions or, or comments, please just raise your hand and, and interrupt me, because uh, I don't want to stand here for the whole day just, just talking to you. I'd love to, to get your, uh, your feedback back as well. With that being said, um, my slides will also be a little bit more informal than I, than I would create them for a, for a real lecture, so to speak. Um, and, what, and one example is one you can see up here. You'll see some of these in this design, which essentially are uh, comments or little quirks or uh, just, let's just a little you know, comment uh, off the cuff to let you know what, what we are about to do. OK, so as the comment says, let's set the scene first. Uh, where am I coming from? My background is in numerical methods for PDEs parabolic, hyperbolic type, Navier-Stokes equations, everything that has to do with uh, flows, mainly or most decompressible ones. And my group and I, we are developing numerical schemes that can solve problems just like the one you see up there. What you see up there is a shock droplet interaction. So we have, um, I'll, I'll show you, I'll skip to the next one already. So you can already see the nice, uh, the nice eye candy. So you have a, a water droplet being hit by a shock wave. And then you can see how it, the surface deforms and how the interaction of the, um, of the flow with the uh, droplet looks like. Let's go back one slide. So what makes this problem interesting to me, it's multi-X, essentially. It's multi-phase. It's definitely multi-scale. And we're also going to need multi-method, speaking about adaptive discretization schemes for such problems. Talk about that later. Uh, in a little bit more detail, just want to highlight that what you see here in the lower half is actually the computational grid and the colors denote different discretization operators, which we use to capture either the interface here with the finite volume method uh, with a TVD scheme, so, so we get nice accurate shocks, and then some P adaptivity, so increase the polynomial degree to capture the nice features of the wake there. And this is what the flow looks like. By the way, I've kind of made the assumption that most of you know something about fluid dynamics. I'll, I'll try to walk the line between um, having something for the specialists interested in fluid dynamics and also for those of you who are not working on that subject. So I'll, uh, let's, let's see how that goes. But if there is something that you completely don't understand at all, have no clue what I'm talking about, please again raise your hand and, and let me know. Second example of multi-phase, multi-method, multi-scale problems are um, icing. So you have ice build up on airfoils. It could be wind turbines or just aircraft. And uh, as you can imagine, this is pretty, pretty dangerous and can lead to uh, serious accidents. But from a mathematical point of view, it's also a pretty complex problem, right? Because those ice shapes, they can look quite multi-scale in nature, pretty fractal, pretty irregular. So how do we actually solve Solve is the wrong word. How do we answer the question, uh, what's the effect of the ice on my airfoil characteristics in terms of uh, lift and drag coefficients, so integral mean coefficients, but also flight safety? Um, and here, what, what we're uh, working on in terms of mathematics is uh, uncertainty quantification methods that essentially allow us to integrate a distribution of those ice shapes into our analysis and then run various simulations that help us to quantify, okay, how does actually um, the ice shape essentially influence my mean statistics. And the last example I want to show of the types of problems I'm interested in solving, um, that it's not multi-phase, but it's definitely multi-scale. So that is coming from true aeronautical engineering. That's a 
uh, transport aircraft. Um, we stole the geometry from Airbus. We didn't, but uh, <laughs> maybe it looks like an Airbus because it is. So, and, and what you what you have here is an Airbus, and um, something like an Airbus, and. Uh, we have a flow over the main wing here. Uh, the aircraft is flying um, at a very high speed, and what happens on the wing is that a shock wave uh, is established. You can kind of see this by this uh, blue line here. And due to some nonlinear interaction of the, with the shock wave and the acoustics, the shock wave is oscillating back and forth on the wing. This is called buffet, kind of strange name, but that is what it's called. And this buffet is, of course, uh, modifying the wing here. And what we are interested in, in my research project, is what happens if this wing wake here, this crazy unsteady motion, interacts with the horizontal tailplane here in the back. There's this little wing here in the back of the aircraft, which essentially um, completely uh, determines the stability of the aircraft. So, <coughs> as I said, this is just by looking at this, you can tell it's a multi scale problem. And I'll uh, directly switch to some of the results. So here is the flow over a small section of such a wing piece, right? And it's a turbulent flow. And what you can see that uh, if we zoom in and keep zooming in and keep zooming in, this um, near fractal behavior of turbulence nicely expresses itself in the simulation results. So as you can probably tell, these are quite large uh, and hefty simulations that we have to run there. And we don't just do that for fun, but our main interest, again, was in observing what happens if this tiny wing here in the back, this horizontal tailplane, the elevator, essentially, uh, what happens if the wingway coming from the front, from the main wing, interacts with this guy here in the back? And then what, what happens? What could go wrong? How does it influence the boundary layer physics and so on? Not talk about that. Just present a nice video, because it kind of um, gives you an impression of what types of problems we are interested in solving. And uh, I'll talk about where we need machine learning, where we can use machine learning to actually help us do that. So you can see from the left now this, these big rollers from the main wing actually are coming in. And for those of you who know something about fluid dynamics, this is very, very, uh, this is almost crazy for the, for the little wing here in the, in the wake because essentially those big rollers they rip the boundary layer off the wing. They can cause local supersonic flow, although the flow is, uh, is transonic. So being able to resolve that um, in time and space, running those simulations, um, is pretty challenging. And that's something that we are working on. OK, so I'll skip the, the analysis. That's, that's mainly um, for, the, for the fluid dynamics guys. So to sum up this, this brief introduction into the types of problems we are dealing with, um, the problems are dominated by multi-X physics, where multi-X could be uh, yeah, multi-phase, multi-scale, multi-whatever. They require multi-model numerics, and by that I mean, A, an adaptive discretization scheme that changes its character to the underlying physics and adapts to that in time and space as well. And it can also mean adding machine learning into the mix. Which, will, which, will, which I will talk about later. And of course, um, all of these problems I've shown here, they are completely dominated by the nonlinear interactions in their equations, meaning they have a high degree of chaos, a very stochastic. Um, they are very, very sensitive to initial and boundary conditions. So running a single deterministic simulation, even a large one, only gives you the answer for this single data point. But if you want to talk about the, the uh, application to real life problems, that's not going to be enough. So we're going to need some form of data analysis or data integration for these problems anyway. So machine learning um, essentially seems like a good fit in order to help us there. And maybe, maybe that's my personal, uh, my personal ambition also to do computations that are on the edge of what is currently feasible. And here's one of the, these common slides. Um, again, I think that understanding the application for what you are doing machine learning is as important as understanding the machine learning model or method itself. 
And that's why I want to spend maybe 20 minutes to talk about the numerics, so the discretization schemes that go into the computations that we've seen. Uh, for those of you who work on PDE solvers, this might not be something new. Those of you who don't, this will just be an overview, essentially showing you the main points of these schemes. So um, we built schemes that are high order accurate for smooth solutions. So the first building block, if you want to run such cases, uh, actually are building high order schemes. And this slide is more tailored toward a non-mathematics background. Um, as a mathematician, you all know that if you have a smooth solution, if you have a high order accurate scheme, you can converge very fast. So errors become small, very fast, whatever fast means. Um, you need the smoothness of the underlying solution, of course, and you need to consider the computational cost because essentially higher order accuracy always requires additional information, additional communication. Um, essentially always some idea of a Taylor expansion comes into play there. And just to show what, <coughs> what high order actually can do in terms of a a solution representation, here, is, uh, here are three turbulent fields. They're all meant to be the same turbulent flow. Middle one is a DNS, so fully resolved H to zero type of, type of computation. And the left and right one, they are um, schemes with 64 cube degrees of freedom. So very, very reduced number of degrees of freedom. The only difference being the left one is a low order scheme, essentially second order finite or first order second order finite volume scheme. And the one on the right is a, a N15 polynomial degree 15 a high order discontinuous Galerkin scheme and just the visual inspection. You don't need to, you know, don't need to uh, compute a fancy error norm to see which one is, is the better one. Um, as I said, we know that for smooth solutions, the error is bounded by H to M plus one where H is a polynomial degree of our ansatz. Am I the one making these noises here? Sorry. OK. Um, and C, we assume to be some constant. It actually is not a constant, but we assume it to be some constant for every discretization, a different one. But um, that's just uh, the way we do that. And if you look, so you can tell or you can see that the error here, the, the error bound becomes really tight if n is large. And if you analyze the dispersion and dissipation properties of those schemes, um, you can see that the higher your polynomial degree, the closer you get to the optimum, so here we have the dissipation property, so we'd like over the whole wave number range, you would like zero dissipation, but if you go for a low order scheme, you can see that it already has a pretty strong um, drop in accuracy, and the higher your n goes, the closer it gets to this theoretical average, uh, theoretical optimum. And the same is true for the dispersion analysis where this uh, blue curve here would essentially tell you a wave with wave number k is also represented by the discrete version as a wave with wave number k, but you can see by the curves that that's not always what's essentially never the case in an under-resolved setting. So these are just to show here that um, high order schemes have better dissipation and dispersion properties, which explain the results that we've seen on the previous slide. You can also think of these schemes in terms of information efficiency. So if you come more from a computer science background and not from a mathematics background, you might be more familiar with the idea of an information efficient scheme, meaning that um, how many points, how many degrees of freedom, how many unknowns do you need to invest if you want to produce a solution within a given error bound? That's essentially what this means. You can. Uh, it's called the number of points per wavelength paradigm in, in, in some communities. And essentially, as I said, it gives you a measure for how accurate, how efficient your scheme deals with the degrees of freedom it has. And if you're familiar with turbulence, you've probably seen this estimate, where you can estimate the total number of degrees of freedom required to solve turbulence in a box cases as a Reynolds number cubed. It's just from physics. That's true, but you also have to include how efficient your numerical scheme is at resolving those scales. This ray cube just comes from the idea of how many scales does my solution express. So what's my finest spatial and temporal um, item I have to resolve, a feature I have to resolve. But the numerical 
uh, quality of your scheme goes in there as well, and that's actually not cubed, but to the power of four. And again, coming back to this example from uh, two slides back, you can see here, so we've repeated the left and right plot here, you can see that for the same number of degrees of freedom, this guy here has an NPPW of four, about four. The theoretical limit would be Nyquist, would be two. So we are pushing, tush, pushing towards that theoretical limit with an N7 scheme. And here we have an NPPW of 16 for this finite volume scheme. And it's just, a, again, this, this re-expression of, of the different qualities. And why do I care about that? I care about that a lot because I want to solve problems, as I said, on the edge of what is computationally possible. And if I just were to repeat this computation here, and I wanted to have the same error bounds as I did with the scheme we've previously seen, with where I needed 1 billion degrees of freedom approximately with an NPPW of 4, if I were to switch to a low order finite volume scheme, that would raise the number of degrees of freedom I need by this factor there. That's essentially a make or break point, right? Just from a, from a practical standpoint, that also means that you need to have 250 something times more computer memory. Story to disk, that's just not happening, okay? So I always show this slide to people who are from industry and they say, oh, we run these schemes here and they are perfectly fine and we don't need anything else. Well, here is your answer, that's true. But if you want to run the seems like, uh, problems like this, you need to come up with something better. Okay, so um, how many of you here are familiar with discontinuous Galerkin schemes? All right, okay, so about 40%, I would say. Okay, cool. Um, for those of you, this will just be boring, so <laughs> but for the rest of you, it will uh, maybe be a brief introduction into these schemes. There are different ways you can go about achieving high order schemes. Uh, and my favorite one are DG schemes because they have a nice, essentially a nice combination of a finite element formulation with a finite volume scheme. And they tend to inherit uh, the best properties of both. When you think about them, you can think about them as, again, as I said, being finite element schemes, bases with uh, compact support but non-global continuity. So instead we have elements here and we have a local polynomial expansion of the solution in each element that's agnostic of everything that happens around it in the, in the adjacent elements. This is then solved by recognizing um, that we have mathematical uh, theory that helps us to deal with jumps in solutions, particularly for hyperbolic problems. So this is solved by going back to finite volume ideas for hyperbolic problems and essentially treating those jumps uh, as Riemann problems with finite volume um, flux functions of your favorite ones. And of course the whole idea is based on the idea of, or the whole scheme is based on the idea, idea of a Galerkin projection or an L2 projection which, gi which gives you optimality in that norm. You've probably seen the derivation of those types of schemes. It always differs a little bit what type of notation you use, but when we start with a standard hyperbolic parabolic conservation law like the Navier-Stokes equations, you do a projection onto the test space here to get to the weak form, and then you do an integration by parts on the volume integral to get back the volume integral, which is just the gradient on the test space here, and using Gauss or Gauss Green, you get a flux function on the surface or a numerical flux on the surface that can be used to connect the elements. So this, the first two are essentially the finite volume part and the second, or the last one is essentially the finite element part. And if you of course set your test space to be a constant, this term goes away and you directly recover the original finite volume integral formulation from the, from the DG scheme as well. Um, linear stability comes from the numerical flux, nonlinear stability, um, already talked about that over breakfast. Um, De-aliasing has been popular for a while. Uh, split forms are popular now. Artificial viscosity is also still popular. Whatever works, uh, people throw at uh, nonlinear stability. Um, but all of these schemes here essentially 
uh, differ in their dispersion and dissipation errors. So there is no free lunch, means that even if we can build good skew symmetric or split form schemes, they tend to have their drawbacks that, um, that uh, creep up on you. The theoretical limit for such polynomial based approximations is an NPPW of pi. It's two for Fourier based approximations for spectral methods, but for this type of method it is pi, so uh, it's not actually two. Um, I already talked about, uh, I did some work on uh, nonlinear stability during my PhD, so this is essentially a, a slide for historic reasons. Um, as I said, uh, in the linear case, you can show that the flux function is essentially giving you stability. And in the nonlinear case, if you are <coughs> under resolved for these types of multi scale problems, I've shown you, um, I've shown you uh, in the beginning, we almost always are. And you have to think about nonlinear stability as well. The type of DG method that we use, um, or you, you can essentially construct your own DG method by choosing basis functions, integration schemes, interpolation schemes, and whatever. And the type of uh, DG method that we used was, I'm not sure if it was invented by David Kupriva, but it was brought to our attention by David Kupriva from Florida State about uh, 12 years ago or so. Uh, he wrote a nice book uh, implementing uh, spectral methods for PDEs. And the idea is pretty simple. It's, it's actually combining the original spectral element idea, of transporting it here into the DG world, where the idea is you collocate the integration and the interpolation nodes. So you essentially, um, in, in other forms of DG, you would have some integration nodes, some interpolation nodes for your solution, and it would always be like an n cubed operation. And here we just co-locate them. So we use tensor product Lagrange polynomials in each dimension, and then we, well, use the tensor, uh, we use the 1D Lagrange polynomials and then extend them by tensor product uh, in each dimension. And as I said, we co-locate the integration and the interpolation nodes, which gives very, very efficient schemes that essentially just go uh, linearly in n per dimension. We can see some of the other details there as well. Just a note, um, this means that we are restricted to element types that support tensor product elements as well, meaning that all our grids are essentially built out of little cubes. Might seem a little bit restrictive, but the cubes can be and should be high order cubes, so they can be curved, right? can all have all kinds of uh, shapes and faces here. They can, of course, be connected in an unstructured manner because we only have a weak coupling, like in a finite volume sense. Um, so no regularity on the grid is required. And uh, we also have hanging nodes or mortars where we do a conservative transfer between um, elements where the sides have, have, not, have not the same, or not, not the same length. Okay, that's for just an overview of the DG method. Um, and maybe I should add that uh, we essentially solve them in time. So we do a method of lines approach. We essentially solve them in time, mostly with standard explicit runger cutter schemes um, because the problems we are interested in, they are so time sensitive anyway that we'd like to have a high resolution uh, in time. There are some IMAX and uh, implicit variance, but most of the problems that we run, um, we can still do faster with an explicit time stepper. Second building block about these schemes is flexibility. Um, so I had, this, I had this, uh, this equation on the board here previously, um, and I've, I've underlined the important part, the important condition. If the solution is smooth, then high order schemes are great. However, if the solution is non-smooth, uh, then we run into all kinds of trouble. And this can happen in two, for two situations. The first one is probably obvious. The first one is, for example, if we have actually a phase interface or a shock wave, right? Then we lose some regularity of the solution, uh, or we would have to be very, very, very fine um, to, to see some of that regularity. So that's the obvious case. Maybe the not so obvious that's shown in this uh, um, orange box here. That is where we have under-resolved multi-scale features. Classical example would be 
turbulent flows, right? Where you have some roughness in your solution that's not supported by your grid, and that essentially, in maybe a little bit simplified terms, makes under-resolved features look like little shocks as well. And shocks, of course, uh, induce Gibbs oscillations. Here is some step function, and you're trying to project that, trying to project that onto a smooth polynomial, and we all know this gives us these uh, ugly oscillations here, which can, of course, uh, violate all, all kinds of uh, conditions. So the maybe most elegant way of doing, of dealing with, with uh, such, uh, such uh, shocks there or such problems is to do an H refinement. So it's kind of hard to see, I guess, here, but you refine the grid in the troubled cell down there in the green grid, and then you do some TVD finite volume approximation, so some low order stable monotone approximation to this solution. It's not nicely drawn here. It's not actually monotone, but you get the, you get the, uh, the gist of it. Um, the second idea, uh, which we are currently exploring, is saying, hey, can we do a convex combination of the original oscillatory polynomial scheme and this stable green scheme here? So can we do a convex combination of both to recover some aspects of the solution. This is a little bit in a, in a trial phase. It's originally proposed by uh, Gassner and Cologne for the, uh, mainly for the MHD case with uh, Mach 500 shocks. Uh, and we're currently looking at it uh, for Navier-Stokes equations as well. But I want to uh, just uh, point out that these two methods are out there. Um, we'll later also talk about artificial viscosity but I think these two are much more elegant and satisfying uh, than the um, artificial viscosity one. So just to gi give you a little bit closer glimpse into uh, the way we do shock capturing is um, we, actually we actually run uh, a DG scheme on our tensor product element. And whenever we encounter a discontinuity that's not resolvable and would induce Gibbs oscillations, we switch to a finite volume representation, of course in a conservative manner, on this subgrid. So here in the DG scheme, we have the solution at these nodes here, which are the supporting nodes, the interpolation nodes of our polynomials. So we do a switch conservatively to a finite volume subgrid, and then we solve this problem here on the subgrid and we use the classical uh, limiters or reconstruction schemes or whatever you have it uh, on this finite volume method to give us a stable representation of the discontinuity. And once the discontinuity passes, we switch back to the smooth DG scheme. So essentially reinterpreting the idea of I either have a large high order cell that has some inner resolution and I'll reinterpret that as a local refined grid where I run a different scheme. Um, that's, the, that's the classical, that's the original method that we use and we also, as I mentioned, have this convex combination where we actually compute the solution on both formulations and then we do a linear blending of the uh, update. Okay. Just showing you again visually what this looks like, let's start with the bottom. Here we have this convex combination, here is a flow, here is a shock, you can clearly see. It's kind of hard to see here. This is the blending, so the amount of, uh, as I said, it's just a linear uh, combination of the DG um, solution and the finite volume solution update, or the smooth and oscillatory uh, and uh, stable and uh, rather dissipative solution. And you can see here that where the shock appears, we have a high coefficient of this blending, so we tend towards the stable scheme. The original version that we run was actually to switch the uh, discretization operator, which you can see here for this uh, forward-facing step problem. So the blue operator here would mean we run a classical high-order DG scheme. The red region means we even run a higher polynomial degree to capture the, uh, the shear layer up there. And the interesting part here is the black, or are the black regions. That's where we switch down to a finite volume representation to do stable shock capturing. Um, as I said, we also do uh, H and P adaptivity in space and time. 
It's again maybe a little bit technical. Uh, just showing you an example again from some of our um, droplet shock interactions. So you can see a visualization of what such an interaction looks like on the left hand slide. Um, this is unpublished work, but I stole it from one of my uh, PhD students uh, preprints, so I hope he doesn't mind. And, on <laughs> and if he does, we don't tell him. Um, <laughs> and on the right hand side, we again now look at what the actual numerical scheme is doing. Again, on the bottom here, you can see that wherever we have phase interfaces or we have shock waves, we switch to this black finite volume solution representation. Wherever we detect that, hey, we have smooth solution that could benefit from p-adaptivity. There are indicators that tell you, should you do h or p? Um, then you actually increase the polynomial degree. Maybe also interesting, but that's more for a computer science talk. Uh, on the top here, uh, we do what's called dynamic load balancing. So of course, the different discretization operators here, they have different computational loads. They are more or less expensive to compute, but you want to run them in essentially in, in single step, right? Each processor, each CPU should finish with its chunk of work at the same time. So what you have to do is to distribute the load equally. And that's what you can see here in the top half. You can see that the elements that have a lot to do numerically, uh, compute thermodynamics across the interface, do shock capturing here in these blue regions, they have less elements per core, whereas the free stream, free stream where not much is going on, they can essentially dump a lot of work on a single CPU. Um, the code we use is called Flexi, and I don't want to advertise it too much, but um, if you are interested, um, there is a nice uh, summary paper on uh, Flexi a uh, couple of years ago that goes into essentially all the details uh, that I talked about. And um, if you want to know more about uh, the code itself, I recommend you wait a couple of weeks before you go to the website because we are still uh, currently under heavy uh, production or re rework of the website, but you will find it on GitHub and there it's, it should be up to date. Okay, just some, some things that we do with this um, code. I said essentially compressible uh, multi-scale flows like the airfoil. We do uh, direct error acoustics, uh, particle laden flows, which I'll talk about in the second part. So. Um, applications that's mainly driven from the turbo machinery guys, so moving uh, grids, uh, sliding interfaces with mortars, get them conservative, uh, but also moving grids um, for fluid structure interaction using uh, arbitrary Lagrangian or Larian formulations. Um, and we've talked about these aspects before. Um, maybe one, one comment um, for the, for the Computer science, are there other computer science people here? No, okay, ah, one, okay. <laughs> so maybe you ask a comment for the computer science people. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to scale those methods um, very well. It's very easy to scale them. Uh, at least if you run an explicit time scheme, uh, and this is essentially shown down here, um, we can actually run this code on the largest machine that we have access to, which is uh, the Hawk computer in Stuttgart, about 500,000 cores, CPU-based cores. And we can run it on that machine and it scales uh, more than perfect, so super linearly on this machine. So that's great, but to be honest, um, somebody told me once DG is a natural scaler. So not, not, not a scalar, but a scaler. Um, so uh, essentially you have to, you have to get this kind of performance out of it. Okay, um, and, and to, to uh, make sure that we also um, are ready for the next generation of supercomputers, which will be all GPU based. We're currently um, in a joint uh, uh, funding operation or we're funded <coughs> by um, EuroHPC to get it onto GPUs as well. Okay. I want to spend two minutes, and then we'll, then we'll jump to the machine learning part. I want to spend two minutes on something that is uh, important to me, and I think it's, it becomes even more important when you start talking about machine learning. And that is to make software and research 
knowledge sustainable. Because we spend a lot of effort and time and also money into developing numerical methods, into writing codes, into generating ML models, into curating data, into producing data. But what we need is to make them uh, fair, meaning, that's an acronym, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's uh, already established in the, in the community, so it means they have to be data, research, whatever, how you define that, has to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So essentially, in a, in a single word maybe, making your research sustainable. So people can profit, inspect, reuse, learn from your research. And we have a nice um, idea in place where we recognize that not just running the code is something that should be made fair, but if you have ever run a large code or if you will run uh, a code in the, in the examples or in, the, in this computer sessions later on. It's not just the code itself, it's how you set up your run, how you choose your parameters, and how you post-process your data. It's even sometimes a matter of what compile flags you use to compile your code. So all of this induces uncertainty into your simulation results, and what we like to have is to be able that we can reproduce any type of result that we produce for work, for a paper, for whatever, we can guarantee, to the best of our knowledge, that we can reproduce that. And for this, we have two things in place, maybe just, just for your information or something that you can think about for yourself. The first one is uh, compile from file. So every file that's generated by the code, every result file that the code writes, also has the information of how to compile the full code plus all the input files, as far as we can, as the input files used to run this code. So you can reproduce a single simulation from a single output file. And a little bit more extensive than that is a, a project where we actually track the full work stack that you would do. So if you would start to run a simulation, you would gather some data, gather some initial conditions, um, set up your code, then maybe implement a new function, a new Riemann flux solver, for example. Um, you would introduce some bugs, you would recompile. So all of this uh, computer engineering would take you a couple of days or weeks. And at the end of this full tool chain with trials and errors, you would produce some nice results, some PNG, some image of a flow. What we do now is we track all of this automatically. You don't need to worry about that. And together with this PNG file, we um, assign a DOI, so a digital object identifier number to that. And under this DOI, we store not, ju not just the image, but this full information here. Meaning that if you publish the uh, figure in a paper or you want to give the data to someone, all they need to do is essentially grab the DOI from our database, first get the image, that's not the most important thing, but what you will get is essentially a one, with one script, you can unroll this whole process and regenerate the original setup, the original uh, set of parameters, models, compile options, and rerun this, um, this whole thing. And at the point I'm, I'm telling this, yeah? Uh, no, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Oh, sorry. When you say that it's um, automati uh, automatically done, do you have like some software that you use that you can tell us the name of, or is it some in-house? It's a self-written okay, Python framework that essentially tracks everything you do. Okay, uh, but it's not available somewhere? It, it, if you want to get in touch, it's, it, I can make it available. <laughs> it's, it's not an out-of-the-box solution that you can download. Um, we're in the process, we make all of our software open source at one point in time but it's not at the point yet where we can distribute it freely. But if you want to get in touch, I'm, I can put you in, in contact with somebody who can, who can give you access. I think there, yeah. <coughs> um, 
do you consider the logs from the runs also to be like a reportable? Uh, like a, do you do you publish the logs? Do you consider the logs of your runs uh, on the simulations or so like uh, to to be part of uh, what you register? For the reproducibility, um, the, the, you mean this, the the thing that's written to the to the screen, exactly the standard yeah. out. Uh, I'm not sure if that is done, um, I, but it's. I mean, it, it could be. I don't. I don't see a reason why you would want to need that. Um, but reproducibility. But I mean, in, in system engineering, for example, for reproducing. I mean, I'm not a specialist. I, I just mm -hmm. seen that. Uh, in other fields uh, as system engineering, uh, the logs are, are actually very important to figure out the state of the system you are trying to monitor. So often I think that if you design your logs, uh, like mm -hmm. what you print on the screen mm -hmm. carefully, uh, those could be also like uh, give clues when you, it's, I mean, when everything works, it's fine, but when you try to, sure. figure, out <laughs> figure, sure. try to figure out what's not working, yeah. I mean, we have, we have a very extensive log when you just run the code in your console. So it tells you a lot about what it, what it thinks it's doing, what it should be doing. Um, I'm, not, I'm not certain if it's written, if it's, written if it's included in there, but it would not be a problem at all to include it in there as well. But thanks for the, thanks for the hint. I'll, 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 ask, uh, I'll ask my guys if this makes sense. Marius, maybe you know that. Are the logs file included in the tra I tracing? I don't think they are. But I agree we could do that. But for our specific application, I'm not sure whether you need to. But it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I have to think. Thank you. OK, thanks for the, for the questions and for the interaction. Um, I want to I close this, this part here. Um, and the reason I brought this up is uh, I think for machine learning, this idea of reproducing making reproducible also for yourself what you are doing, making traceable is so much more important than just for solving PDEs. Um, because we are still at the level of having a lot of black boxiness in, uh, in machine learning. So being able to at least reproduce the black box would be a great first step to, uh, well, not just establish trust, but also to gain trust in, in uh, in these uh, machines. I mean, if you give the, you know, if you give the same prompt to ChatGPT three different times, you get three different answers, and two of them are okay, and one of them is complete rubbish. So um, maybe uh, just as a as a suggestion, also to think about when we do machine learning, um, how to make sure that uh, stochastic learning process is understood and and reproducible as much as we can. Uh, and that is what I mean with, for machine learning, FAIR is mandatory. Yeah? And so uh, the idea would be to be able to reproduce, like if you train a model, you would be able to repro reproduce training exactly just from this, uh, okay. as exactly as possible. Exactly as possible. I mean, okay. yeah. I get, yeah. To, I, to I end up with the same weights, like for instance, if you're training a model. Have, to the, have the same uh, TensorFlow version, right? know how the TensorFlow version was installed, with uh, which libraries it was installed. That's the first step you need to take, right? So start from the very, ba at best you would be able to reproduce the hardware, but that's of course not happening. But start from the very basic level, because um, from our experience, especially with machine learning and the rapid development of, of methods and, and tools, this is where things go wrong a priori, right? Different TensorFlow version gives you different outputs. Um, uh, you, you didn't expect, and this is what I'm, what I'm, what I think is important. We at the moment do it for our classical PDE solver stack, um, and we see the benefits of that. But uh, I, uh, I would urge everybody to who does machine learning, it doesn't have to be this system, but but think about a system of of including that. Okay. So. Let's talk about. Let's talk about part two. Or, or let me let me see if there are any further questions in the room. Okay. So from from now on, this DG method and this framework will just be in the background um, and will serve as our 
playing field, so to speak. So I'll not talk about that um, too much, but we'll, we'll have this as our, as our PDE solver in place, the one that we're trying to actually do um, machine learning with. So in the second part of my talk, I'll talk about supervised learning for CFD. Um, when people talk about machine learning, at least from my perspective, uh, 95, per, well, maybe not 95, but maybe 90% of all the, uh, of, the, of the methods or the paradigm that people think about is supervised learning. And when you check out the literature, not just for aerospace engineering or fluids, but all types of engineering, it's mostly um, people use supervised learning to solve some of their sub-problems. So we started working on this uh, about five years ago, and I want to share a few examples of where we succeeded and where we failed with supervised learning for CFD. This is not meant to be an intro to supervised learning at all. You've, you've, you've heard, uh, or you're, you're way too knowledgeable <laughs> uh, about supervised learning for me to tell you something about that. Um, but it's a little bit meant to be as a you know, showcase of where things worked, why they worked, where things went wrong, why they went wrong, and what we can learn uh, from, these, uh, from these lessons for the future. So this will not be a conference talk with a straight success story, <laughs> but this will be a talk where, um, well, uh, yeah, we'll end up at a point um, where I uh, essentially uh, might make a controversial statement about supervised learning. So, um, controversy ahead. <laughs> uh, again, this is my opinion and my experience, so you might uh, disagree or not. Uh, that's fine. Um, before talking about this controversy a little bit, I want to first make my statement what I mean by scientific machine learning, or what that means for me. Uh, what that means for me from my perspective, and again, I guess there are different uh, flavors of what scientific machine learning means. And I mean that in the context of CFD, of course. So, um, as we've seen, the interesting PDEs, they are nonlinear, sensitive. Uh, and they describe, of course, the nature's most basic tenets of what a flow should do. So they are conservative, they are stable, and they obey uh, invariances. And we have PDE solvers that can guarantee all of this. Not all of them at the same time, but you know, to varying degrees, you have to essentially, there is no free lunch, you have to pick what type of physical consistency or mathematical property you want to include. But we have PDE solvers that can do this. And I'm making the statement that ML models must also do this to be useful and to have a chance of um, bringing some form of improvement or augmentation. And we are not there yet, right? So I'll show you examples of where um, our machine learning models actually fail at guaranteeing these properties. There's a lot of work being put into how to make the models themselves, um, for example, be conservative, uh, obey invariances, and so on. Either the models or kind of ensure that during the training process. But there is no converged uh, or agreed upon solution yet. Convergence is a good, uh, a good, uh, a good keyword because uh, we know what a PDE solver does when we go h to 0. Uh, we don't know what a machine learning solver does uh, when we do that, or at least I don't know if anybody knows. <laughs> Maybe, I'm sure people have tried, but um, we're still lacking some, some basic uh, understanding of um, how these models behave. And it's, of course, very difficult, it's highly nonlinear and high dimensional. Um, for our classical PDE solvers, we have some error bounds, some error estimates. Um, we ha know where they are, what I call trustworthy, and where they are not. So machine learning methods must also give us some clues about that. And that's uh, for the computer science guys. Um, computational fluid dynamics, as we've seen it here, is a high performance computing problem. So this, these simulations, they run of thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands of CPUs, take a lot of computing time and 
managing that efficiently, effectively, writing algorithms that do good number crunching is a challenge in itself. So now we just want to join ML to that in some sense. Um, so this becomes a computer science problem as well. And there are just some ideas about mixed precision computing, but um, it's again maybe a little bit more for the, for the computer science crowd. So my predictions from what I've seen, um, MLAI will not replace PDE solvers. And there might be, or there are some people who are um, probably not happy with the statement uh, and who are strongly pushing for uh, essentially the family of pins or everything that's, that's associated with pins to actually replace PDE solvers in the classical way and, and do uh, pin computations instead. I don't think that this will happen. Um, ML models are particularly useful for abstracting empirical knowledge. It's one reason why I think they will succeed. I'll show you an example of what I mean by that, but maybe that's a little bit tough for a mathematician, but when you run your, when you run your actual uh, computational code, a lot of empirical knowledge called fudge factors go into running a simulation. So oftentimes, of course, when we run such complex problems, um, we lack the mathematical theory to, uh, to fix all the parameters and tell us what to do. So practical applications always means there will be some tolerance you have to set in your GMRS, for example. And the third point um, where I think things will head or are heading, there is a combination of machine learning that will fit into PDE solvers and ML models will just become, just like a Fourier transform, they will become a tool that you can fit to your classical PDE solver to augment it in some form where the PDE solution is uh, elusive or we don't know what to do with it. So what I think will happen is we'll see some hybrid CFD ML codes uh, in the not so near future and you can essentially cross out CFD and replace any other field of engineering acronym there as well. Okay, so these are just my, my thoughts on what will happen and I'll not talk about supervised learning on a single slide because this is really basic stuff. But I want to point out, I uh, want to talk a little bit more on where machine learning now comes into play for CFD. And this is essentially what I call <laughs> This is what I essentially call, I was, I was a fan of the pin networks then. <laughs> uh, um, the scale gap where I think um, machine learning models can help us. So everything that has to do with sub models for problems. We've seen this, I've seen this example, I've shown this example before of the, of the airfoil and this is just to make the, the point again that nonlinear systems are multi-scale in nature and they are very sensitive to initial and boundary conditions, meaning that what happens on the scale here in terms of boundary layer separation, so the tiniest features on the, on the trailing edge of this airfoil here, can influence the characteristics of the flow on this level, on this scale here, on the, of the airfoil of the wind turbine itself, which will of course affect the whole rotor flow which will have a consequence on where to put the individual wind turbine in a wind park. So this is a nice example of what is a multi-scale problem and what makes multi-scale problems so challenging. And to make it a little bit more formal is that in order to be able to solve these problems, we have to come up with formulations for the different governing equations on micro, meso, macro scales, whatever you want to call them in your field. There is an example on the right hand side which is from porous media flows. So we have the flow in an individual pore here. So you see a tiny pore there and a free surface and a flow going in there. And then of course to be able to solve this here uh, by some uh, viscous Navier-Stokes type equation um, is very expensive already. So if you want to upscale that 
to the poor level, sorry, to the network level, you have to come up with some upscaling operation, some coarsening operation um, to be able to solve the equations more efficiently and then close them on this level by some model that takes into effect the fine scale poor interactions. And the same thing goes if you go from the poor level to this uh, continuum level one up. So for these cases, we have to define some coarsening operator, uh, which actually is probably ambiguous. And then we solve the coarse grained equations plus some closure model. I call them, I come from turbulence, so I call them closure model. Um, could call it be called subgrid model or subspace model or, or I don't know. So we have the governing equations on some level uh, L and we have the coarse grained equations on some level H here. And of course we have to solve the original equations plus some modeling term, some closure term to account for the scale effects. And this is precisely here in the definition or in the modeling of this M that's where I see the chance for machine learning. And why is that? Well, the reason for that is we have to do some form of data compression or low order representation of data, right? We have a lot of information about fine scale. I think it's, could it be the laser? It's happened, well, not sure. Um, so when I have a lot of, It's okay. Um, so we have a lot of fine scale information and we just want to account for the effects of this fine scale information on the coarse grained level. So there is an induced reduction of information, reduction of dimensionality from here to here. And this is precisely what machine learning should be able to do and help us with. So this is the setup for the examples I want to talk about in the uh, next uh, section, which will be, uh, which I call machine learning for data-driven submodels. So this submodel idea is, okay, I have some governing equation on some level, on um, some course level, and I have some modeling term accounting for a different level, and I want to bridge this gap here. So this is in, uh, expressed by this expression here. I'm solving my original equations on level L, uh, sorry, my, uh, my governing equations on level L, and I need to find some approximate model M tilde to account for the effects here. I cannot, of course, incorporate these effects directly, but in order to do them, to, to get a, the equal sign here, I would have to have access to the fine scale solution U small L, where I only want to run, of course, on the level of U capital L. And for, from, from our work, um, there's been a lot of successful applications here where these submodels could be Riemann solvers, diffusion coefficients and such uh, poor formulations, um, Reynolds average Navier-Stokes closure coefficients and so on. And the basic idea is always the same and we'll see this, um, this sketch here uh, at least one more time. We split this thing here into two, okay? So we start, classical supervised learning idea, I start with an offline training on my data. I generate some data for this guy that I want to learn. This can be from experiment simulation or analytical data. I feed that into my machine learning method, my supervised learning neural network, kernel method, whatever. And out comes, after successful training, some model. And when I'm satisfied and convinced that uh, it's not overfitting and such, I'll take this model and then I combine it. So I do this addition here or this subtraction and then I solve this equation up here by putting my model back into the equation. And then I run the forward propagate through the model and then I solve my problem. So this is the basic setup which I'll be using in the next couple of slides. And what I wanted to show now are actual examples where this works. Where this works in combining CFT solver with a machine learning model. 
before coming to cases where it doesn't work. <laughs> so the first one um, is a pretty, uh, it was a pretty nice and successful uh, approach, I think. Um, that's about local truck capturing for DG. So we talked about how shocks are uh, not something that is well represented by smooth polynomials. So we have to do something in terms of numerical stabilization, treatment of these um, waves in our hyperbolic problem, which is called, in my community, shock capturing. And just to show you a nice picture of, uh, of course, where shock act actually occur, uh, not just in hyperbolic PDEs, but also in nature. Um, here is a, a nice, uh, it's a photograph, but color, the colors have been enhanced by NASA over two fighter jets, and you can nicely see uh, the waves coming out of this running into the shock wave here. It's kind of it's kind of nice to see. Okay, just to remind ourselves, um, shocks and high order polynomials or discontinuities and high order polynomials don't work well together. So, if I want to run my DG scheme, my high order scheme, and a shock may occur. I need to, as I said, do something called shock capturing, which is adjusting my numerical method to be able to stably and accurately um, represent my discontinuity on the grid. And there are various methods one can do that, but they're essentially all called shock capturing. And what they all have in common is that they decrease the local accuracy. It kind of makes sense. You're trying to approximate a discontinuous function by a smooth solution, so in some sense you have to also become discontinuous. But you want to use these methods only at the shock. They are usually very dissipative, so you only want to make sure that you do localized shock capturing. So whenever we have a shock like this, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see by the change in colors there is the shock front, which is actually moving back and forth, so it's not steady. First thing to do is to detect where this shock occurs so you can then adjust your numerical scheme. So what you would ideally like to have is some function, some classifier essentially, that tells you, oh, we have an element and this element will contain a discontinuity. And this is where the trouble starts. Because detecting what a shock is might sound trivial to you, but it's not trivial to do that in a computation, right? All you're dealing with are discrete values, your left and your right neighbor, for example. How to tell that this is actually a shock or not, and not just an under-resolved smooth phenomenon, right? Uh, or it's just your numerical scheme inducing some error, some dispersion error that creates a strong gradient that's not actually a shock. And the way this problem is solved, solved in quotation marks, is um, there are about 10 to 15 functions proposed in literature called shock detectors, or sometimes called troubled cell detectors or shock indicators. And all they do is they take your current solution and they flag regions where they detect a shock. So basic, most basic thing is to look at polynomial decay, oh, sorry, decay of polynomial coefficients at some smoothness. Other, thing, uh, other uh, indicators look at some entropy production. Um, the point is, all of these, all of them are empirical. What makes them empirical is not so much the derivation, although some of them also have empiricism in them, but what makes them empirical is that you run them on irregular grids you run them for different numerical schemes that have different approximation properties. So the long story short is, in practical simulations, all of these indicators have fudge factors. Okay? So you start your numerical simulation, you set your shock indicator function, has some parameter, you set that to something that sounds reasonable, or the default setting, and then you run your simulation and either simulation is stable and you capture the shock, or 
simulation becomes unstable, your shock indicator wasn't configured correctly, and the simulation crashes. If you push the indicator too far to one side, simulation will become stable but very dissipative. So all of this is to say that finding a good shock detector is an iterative process. And if I found a good one for this case, and I'll change the angle of attack, or run not this air file but another one, I'll have to redo all of this over and over again. Of course, it gets a little bit better with experience, but often, especially when you have students um, starting on this, <laughs> you, can, you can keep them busy for quite a while um, running these cases and getting the shocks nice and sharp and the simulation stable. So this is where we set out, because this was getting on my nerves. Um, I said, OK, can we not do better? Because this sounds like a machine learning problem. This sounds like a problem where we have empirical knowledge. Empirical knowledge comes from the fact that we don't understand the actual interplay of numerics and physics well enough. Can I find a machine learning method that will tell me there is a shock or there is not a shock? And to make it more useful for high order methods, we not just need to find which grid element contains a shock. That's not too difficult to do. That's pretty robustly done. But I want to know on what or where precisely in an element on my subspace level, so on essentially on, the, on my distance between two interpolation points. This is h over n plus 1, where h is my grid spacing in 1D, and n is my polynomial degree. So I want to know where the shock is on an element subscale. So here is this, here is this dilemma. I run a high order DG scheme. My element had about this size here on the top of the airfoil. And just knowing that the shock would be in this element uh, would be a start, but not very useful. What I'd like to know is actually which collocation point or interpolation point is closest to the shock wave. So that's what, what we set out to do. And when we set out to do that, there was no such a thing. Okay? The, the, the um, shock indicators that were used, they would work with just the cell information. So they would give you, there is a cell, there is a shock, do something about it. Just for the, um, to, to set the scene a bit, um, there are different ways one can do shock capturing. The uh, one we've talked about before is the discretization-based shock capturing, where wherever we have a shock wave or a discontinuity, you switch the discretization to a stable, more dissipative one. You can kind of see that when you look closely that I've, I visualized the white in white here, the subgrid that we use to solve the finite volume schemes on. This gives you nice and stable and accurate sharp shock waves. But from a, from a practical point of view, it's of course, um, and also from a mathematical point of view, quite frankly, it's also um, a lot of work to formulate both schemes compatibly and then to implement both schemes compatibly and run that efficiently. That, that's a lot of work to do. It takes a lot of time to do that. And instead, what's very easy and implemented in half a day is an artificial viscosity approach. You just add some regularization through a, a second order parabolic term, essentially acting like a local diffusion. So that's uh, what else, what's called artificial viscosity for us. So these two, these two approaches um, essentially exist. So um, the way we, we tackled this problem for finding where a shock wave is, we formulated it as a supervised learning uh, of a classifier. And machine learning always means, supervised learning means you need tons of data. So we didn't want to run uh, tons, of, uh, tons of shock tube problems, but instead we know from the shock conditions essentially what a shock looks like in 1D. So we can train or we can generate training samples that are both smooth and non-smooth. It's a bunch of smooth functions and a bunch of non-smooth functions. And then generate as many training samples analytically from that as we want it. 
And we can do that and project these solutions onto our polynomial space, aka we can, we can choose a bunch of, we can generate the functions, we can generate chocked and non-chocked, non-chocked solutions, and then we can project them onto our polynomial base so we know in our polynomial space what these guys look like, how the polynomial would see them. And the first, the first approach was to say, okay, let's see if this works for an element. So can we detect with machine learning whether there is such a shock in an element? And of course, here's all the, all the technical details for the machine learning class. As I said, we did that with a convolutional neural network-based uh, classifier because we're interested in um, spatial correlations, yeah? You're you're saying that uh, you're looking at how the coefficients of your polynomial behave in the case of uh, shock or whatever. But if you change the basis, uh, so you have to train another yeah. model. Okay, and if you just add an element to the basis, it's the same. You will have to train yeah. another model. Okay. Yeah, it's true. I'll, I'll show examples okay. later on. You have to. You have to. Um, that's 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 perfectly correct. For a fifth order basis, you have to retrain the model for a seventh order basis. Yeah, that's true. And you can't go down either. If you train it for seven, you have to retrain it for yeah. five. Yeah, okay. okay, so, um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so here are, here are the examples. Um, actually, I've never tried that, but. <laughs> 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 My yes came too quickly. <laughs> it was an optimistic yes. <laughs> um, so here are the technical, the technical details of, of uh, of how to, how to train those, those models. If you're interested in more on the technical stuff, you can, can ask me later. Um, so here are some examples of how that worked. Um, and that worked surprisingly well. Um, here are some, um, I'm not showing the 1D Riemann problems, but there are 2D Riemann problems and the double Mach reflection case, which are the classical hyperbolic test cases uh, if you ever uh, work with those types of schemes for shock capturing. And you can see just by visual inspection that with this trained model, we can nicely detect those gradients here, okay? And also here for the double Mach reflection, um, we can reasonably accurately capture where the shocks are located. It's pretty difficult, <laughs> it's pretty difficult to, uh, to get a good quantitative figure of merit for a good shock capturing, but um, we looked at the uh, sharpness and width of the shock capturing, uh, and that all looked, uh, looked rather nice. What's also important here, um, these are unsteady problems, and especially if you've ever run these cases, and especially the startup phase is pretty violent. So this was also stable through the startup phase, although I'm just showing here the results at the later stage. Yes, please, there's a question up there. Hello, I'm a bit confused about the shape of your elements because I think in this slide you are explaining that you exactly want to locate the exact integration point where the shock uh, happens and not only the cell. You have kind of non-square large cells and inside small uh, square elements mm -hmm. and I think the CNN you are training it only on square patches. Mm -hmm. Very good. And so could mm -hmm. you just precise what is square and what is non-square, mm -hmm. please? Let me, let, me jump, let me jump two slides ahead to make this clearer. Sorry, I should have made that clearer from the beginning. So I'm jumping ahead here just to show this, this plot here. So we are using unstructured grids that are hexahedral, have hexahedral elements. You can see them here. That's how they look like. They can be connected in an unstructured way, but that's not important. We transfer each of these elements to a unit cube reference element. So no matter what the shape in physical space, we do some mapping with a Jacobian and put them in this reference cube. And then we only train on this reference cube. So for my machine learning model, all of my inputs are just cubes. They are perfect cubes and I can do a uh, convolutional uh, 3D tensor um, expansion on them, okay? 
thank you. But thank you for the question. But the, the, the examples I'm showing here, we'll come to the other ones later, so it's kind of spoiled a little bit, but the examples I'm showing here, you're perfectly right. These grids, they are all regular. Yeah, question? Yeah, sorry, I have a question. Sure. Um, when you were showing the shocks, the signature with the Gibbs oscillation is more like a wiggle. So when you generate your patches, they look like very regular, like a real shock, not like a yeah. numerically wrongly yeah. captured shock. These are, these are the analytical solutions, but then we project them onto the polynomial basis, and then they look like wiggles. Okay. So for the training, this is just you know, the analytical solution I've shown here. Um, this one. But depending on what basis you project them onto, they look like they would look for the, for the basis. Okay, great. But good, good question. That was actually a, uh, an important step in getting this to work, this recognition that you need to do that. Okay, so um, thank you for the questions. Um, any other questions? No? Okay. So this was a nice first step. Um, as I said, it's pretty, pretty difficult to compare different shock indicators against one another because they only work during the actual computation, so it's always um, yeah, tricky to come up with good metrics. Uh, here's my favorite metric, the I-norm. In the I-norm, comparing my shock uh, locations to hand-tuned, established indicators from literature, named after Olaf Person uh, and Anthony Jameson, very famous guys in fluid mechanics. Um, person more in numerics and Jameson for everything else. Um, hand tuned, right, to give good results, you can tell that the machine learned indicator does a good job, does a reasonable job. In fact, it does a pretty great job because I don't have to relearn or retrain my machine learning indicator for different grid resolutions. Once I have it for a specific, specific polynomial basis, and due to the trick we mentioned before, this works essentially for all the resolutions that I have, uh, and it doesn't have any user-defined parameters. I just use my neural network, plug it in, and it gives me these stable and accurate shock results. People sometimes cringe when I say there are no user-defined parameters, because of course the neural network has 10,000 user-defined parameters, essentially. But what I mean by that is the user doesn't have to put any parameters in there. This empirical knowledge or the semi-empirical knowledge has been abstracted into the neural network through the training process. That's what I meant in, the, in one of my three points on the slide. What can machine learning actually do for us? So, um, so that was great. That was a first great um, success for us. No retraining for different grid resolutions, no parameters, take it, run a bunch of other problems, cases I'm not showing, and this gives us good and accurate results. And now we come to the second part. What, the, what I've shown you up to now is how to flag an individual element and uh, saying this contains a shock or it doesn't contain a shock. I guess we are five minutes early, but it's probably a good time to stop now and then continue with this part after the break. Thank you so far. <laughs>